Today's going to be a little different because I want to talk for a second before I preach. Is that okay? I want to talk to kind of what's going on in our country a little bit and the church and the church's response to it. And then we're going to get into uh, everything. Because here's the thing, guys. The Bible says that we are to obey the laws of the land, correct? So we want to do our best as a church to represent Jesus well. And we're going to follow the recommendations of our uh, government, our local government, and all that stuff about what we should do, what we're not supposed to do, all that kind of stuff. All right? So... I, I do want to let you know that um, if West Virginia goes the way every other state around us is going, um, we, might have, we might have to shut down service for a week or two. I don't know yet. I'm not claiming that, and I stand on that. But if it happens, we're working to, move every, working to be able to meet you guys digitally and even live stream some things. So we'll still be having service, even if it's just me and 10 people up in here streaming it. Just make sure you still meet us at the same time or follow us on Facebook to know what we're doing or look at the website. Just stay connected to everything going on. And you know, make sure that, like Pastor G said, we continue to show up and love and serve and sow and do the things we're supposed to do to keep moving. I'll tell you right now, the Bible makes it very plain. And I'm not trying to teach people how to manipulate situations. But the Bible is very plain that when you become a sower and you sow in famine, that's when God really opens up some things. Like this season right now is a perfect time to be sowing, to be given. So this, this virus, for example, is an opportunity for the church. And I'm going to explain to you why. So I see a lot of stuff floating around Facebook. People are like, well, why are they having church if churches are supposed to be closed? First off, West Virginia, that is not the case. Uh, and even in Maryland, which we have a church in Maryland, I had service this morning in Maryland. And in Maryland, for example, like most states, if you have a group of over 250 people gathering at one time, they ask you not to do it. So that's kind of the, the way that they're going. And they're also telling you to practice social distancing. For example, in my pastor's church, in order for them to stay open because the county was going to close them down, they had to literally agree to having someone out front with a clicker. And they have to sit. If you're not related to someone, you have to sit four feet apart from them. If you're not a couple or related, and that's kind of how they, they ain't playing. It just depends on where you're at and what's going on. So here's the thing. We're going to do whatever we're supposed to do to be compliant, but also know this. We don't operate in fear here. Uh, we, we, operate in, we operate in faith, and I am not disrespecting anyone that decided to cancel their services or whatever. Listen, if you're feeling sick or if you're older especially and you want to stay home and watch online, all that, that is fine. That is we are not, no, no, there's no pressure. Just know this morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments. About a month ago, actually it was about six weeks ago, I was seeking the Lord about some new series I wanted to preach this year. And out of nowhere, the Lord spoke to me and said, I need you to, to start working on a series on fear. And I had no idea any of this was going to happen. And so I planned on preaching on fear in the summer, but because of all this, I pushed it all up. So I'm, I'm, some of what you're getting this morning is completely new, completely fresh, and, and, and all that. And some of it might be completely made up because I had time to study everything. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, we're, we're starting a new series this morning on fear. The title of my message today is going to be this, The Wind or the Word? The Wind or the Word? Like I said, I want to talk to you for a few seconds. I know that uh, Pastor G said, for example, we've had to reschedule some things. I know that we have small groups that meet and we're... Uh, halting those right now. Well, let me tell you something. That's just an official capacity. I'm not telling people they can't gather, get together, hang out with their small group. I can go. Our, our Frederick small group is so serious about what they do. They've already set it up as a Facebook small group. They're, they, it's not stopping. So um, just know that we're, what, what we do is one in response, first and foremost, to make sure our people are safe and we use wisdom. And also, we respect the laws of the land. That's who we are, okay? So just know that's where we stand on it. But why, why the church is still open? Because the church is the local hope of the world. And the, I'm going to teach you some history. Can I nerd out in history and then preach the sermon? Good, because I'm going to do it anyway. That's why I skipped the video. So listen, a lot of people don't know this. One of the reasons that Christianity took hold and grew the way that it did, a lot of people don't realize this, that when... The name Christian was initially given to the followers of Jesus Christ as a negative connotation, as a slang. 
It meant literally translated little Christ running around, little Jesuses. Because the early church, they took their relationship with God that serious, they realized that we are called as believers to reflect the nature, the love, the life, and the power of the king we say we serve. I'm afraid that the majority of the American church especially has built itself more on entertainment than we do on power. We don't have power church anymore. We have popular church. We got smoke machines that think the anointing's there. I've been in churches where they had the greatest production I had ever seen in my life. I mean, I thought I was at a Hollywood show, and I'm telling you, Jesus was nowhere near that building. They had a good show, they had a good all that, but the presence of God wasn't there. Here's the thing. The early church grew heavily because of how the church responded to the chaos, epidemics, and troubles of their day. So let me tell you, just a little break you down a couple things. One of the early hubs of Christianity was a city named Antioch. Antioch was so overblown with people, with disease, with sickness. In Antioch, there was an estimated 117 people per square mile. Not mile, but acre, my bad. Per acre. So if you, have a hundred, if you live on one acre of ground this morning... Imagine 117 people living there with you. And they lived on top of each other because they, they didn't have specialty builders. A lot of times they put these buildings up. If you lived on the bottom row, bro, you short. It could all come crash. Your life could come crashing down in a literal sense. It was dangerous. The sicknesses and disease was rampant. One of the reasons Christianity exploded in a world that was anti-Christian, against Christians, it, it, one of the reasons is because the Christians, not only did they have a longer life expectancy, they handled tragedy and pandemics and sicknesses differently, and these signs follow them that believe in my name. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Christians were always the first to respond to sickness, disease, tragedy, and turmoil. And because of their faith and what God was doing in them and their, their, their joyous outlook, because whether you know this or not, the people in the Bible, the Apostle Paul believed he was living in the end times. Because he was. I don't have time to teach because the kingdom of God is something that's happened, is happening, and will happen. Because Jesus will come again one day. But from the moment Jesus said it's finished and he rose and went to heaven, the end times, that's when it began. There's the, oh, I'm waiting on this, this and that, this and that to happen. Listen, people have been waiting every generation. And every time there's a plague, every time there's this, the Lord's returning. This has always been the case. So calm down. The enemy will use fear to disrupt you and keep you from God's best for your life. Jesus said, occupy till I come. He didn't say be scared, hide, freak out, suck your thumb. Occupy, take territory. The Bible says even if a thousand fall at my right hand, ten thousand my left, it won't come near me. I will walk up into a hospital, the Lord tells me to, and lay hands on a sick person in Jesus' name. And I've had a lung disease, and I ain't scared. What I'm saying is this, we use wisdom but we also understand where the church comes from, who we are. If we're charismatic, if you're a charismatic believer, that means you're not a cessationist. It means I understand that Jesus Christ, the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, has power over all things. And his name is above every name. I'm not dumb. I'm not foolish. I'm not running around like I can't get sick because I'm saved. None of that. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Stop acting like that's faith. That's nonsense. It, what I'm saying is that God can keep you. God can protect you. God can give you power. Even if you, listen, you could be rolled. I could tell you a testimony and a story of how they tested the hands of John G. Lake. When John G. Lake was in South Africa during the plague laying hands on people and God was healing them, they said, how in the world is this man not sick? They tested his hands and, the, and there was virus and stuff on his hands and he wasn't getting sick because the glory of God and the anointing that was on his life kept that stuff from coming into the man. Now, that's not for everybody all the time. All I'm telling you is that don't think that there's any kind of virus or sickness that's bigger than God. The church has always been the first responder. Why is the church staying open? Because we're supposed to be here. 
We're, we, we are the light to a dark world. We're the place where people should be able to come. and be. T- it is not, listen, if you don't believe that God's still a healer, that God still protects, that God, that's on you. I, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I do. So as long as I'm not breaking laws, I'm doing what I'm called to do. Be here for the lost, hurting, scared, broken, sick, diseased. As a matter of fact, whether you're in Africa or whether you're in South America or, or in Washington, D.C., if you see an ambulance go by, whether it's green or whether it's red, what's it have on it usually? A cross. Why? Because Christians are the ones that founded hospitals. We're here for the sick. We forget this. Because we're too worried about being popular, having big churches, filling big buildings with converts from other churches because you do church better. We act like we're in revival when we don't have any power anymore. We're scared to death. As a matter of fact, please, please, please don't take all of our toilet paper home. God, real talk. This has scared me half to death. Because a few years ago, I had to make an announcement because people were stealing toilet paper. And there wasn't no coronavirus. There was just some kind of booty plague going around or something. Up in here stealing all the toilet paper. If you're that hemmed up, take a little swipe and don't take the whole roll. Okay, I'm going to get to my sermon now. That was just all extra. If you are a first-time guest here, they should have warned you about me before you came. Uh. (laughs) That was not cool, man. But let me read something to you. If you ever, if you're a history nerd like me and you like to learn about, like, different things, how it really was and not what you heard, what you read in a blog, um, there's actually a, a book that I read in seminary by a guy who wasn't, I don't even know if he's a Christian. I know he's a sociologist, and he wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity called Rodney Stark. It's an amazing book that talks about, for example, it has a whole chapter, and I highlighted some stuff to read to y'all real quick before I preach. It's actually on epidemics, networks, and conversion, and it's talking about how Christianity uh, offered a much greater uh, light in the culture at the time. The mortality rate amongst Christians was different, and um, whenever disaster struck, the Christians were better able to cope, and as and this resulted in a higher rate of survival, and it made it easier for Christians to convert people. And it's one of the reasons why conversion happened so fast, such a large level, because, you know, there's epidemics and things going on in the earth, and the Christians are there showing up on the scene, laying hands on people, praying for them, believing God for them, and God's healing people, touching people, keeping people, and, and it's that. Why else do you think people that's, that's been inundated with a certain pagan religion for 500 generations of their life all of a sudden will switch over and become a Christian? Why? Because they realize they tasted something that's better than what I thought I knew. And so that's, you know, just, just so you know, for all those that's on Facebook trying to bash churches for why the ones that are open are open, that's for you. There's no reason to bash anyone for being open. There's no reason to bash anyone for live streaming. Y'all need to calm down. I hope y'all are watching through stream too. I'm talking to y'all. Any of y'all that's worked up over either of those things, I am talking about you. And and you know my number, so you can call me. It's okay. All right. We ready for the word this morning? We're starting a... We're starting a series this morning... Dealing with fear. And I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 14 if you have your Bible. Because fear, one thing this whole coronavirus thing, uh, I should, COVID thing, because there's, you know there's multiple coronaviruses, right? There's not just one. So, anywho. One thing to learn is that the media can really decide how you respond to any kind of tragedy they will work you up scare you to death and have you I'm telling you have you all worked up and 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 whatever it's amazing to me how well I ain't got time to go there I'm not going to talk any of that stuff let's stay to the Bible let me just say this to you fear is used by the enemy as an opposite tool to faith because what fear does fear breeds anxiety and doubt And it hinders your your ability to see things clearly or to believe God or think God is for you and not against you. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that without faith it's impossible to please God. Watch what it says. It it says this. It says, for 
he who comes to God must believe that he is and must believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. What the enemy is after is your ability to see God as a good God. As a matter of fact, the, the, the world system will try to show you things that happen and call it an act of God that wasn't even an act of God whatsoever. God's going to get you. Look what he did. Hurricane Katrina was an act of God. No, it wasn't. That wasn't an act of God. God is a good God all the time. God's going to get you. If God was going to get you, you'd have done been God. Especially some of y'all up in here. Oh, the church, the church would burn down if I showed up. Trust me, up in here, if, that was, if it was possible for a church to burn down and hell to freeze over because of people, it's already been accomplished with half of the people to come to Destination Church. And I'm telling you, it's not burning. So you were good. The fact is, you have to understand, God is a good God. If God, if, listen, why is it that Jesus, before the story I'm about to read to you, is dealing with a storm, and he steps out, talks to it, and rebukes it. If a storm was an act of God, Jesus would have just rebuked himself. I'll let you think about that for a minute. The fact is, there are things that God allows. It doesn't mean he's the one that's the author of it. As long as the earth remains, for example, the Bible makes it plain, the earth itself groans really under the full weight of sin, waiting for the appearance of the sons of God. The longer this earth goes and the more immoral and unholy and nasty we like to become, the more it starts to tremble. And here's the crazy thing. We don't understand that, that if we're not careful, our fear can grip us in such a way that we can't move into who God's calling us to be as the sons of God. Fear can grip you and leave you stuck. If you don't believe me, let's go to the Word. We're going to read about something this morning. And my question for you is, are you going to be a person of the winds or a person of the Word? Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. If you got to say amen, you should have it by now. If not, you're cheating looking on the screen. Just say you're cheating. I'm reading from the New King James. It's probably not what they have upstairs, but that's okay. Just put it behind me. People can figure out the difference. It's all good, sis. Praise the Lord. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Jesus is sending his disciples on a mission, and he's like, look, man, I'll meet you over there. That's where I'm going to meet you. But he leaves them to go by themselves. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out for fear. And immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It's me. Stop tripping. <laughs> Peter said to him, Peter got a big mouth. Always has something to say. Big mouth sailor man Peter yells out, if it's you, Jesus, tell me to come. Jesus says, come. Come. Peter steps out, and the Bible says that he walked on the water to go to be with Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Not why did you fear? Why did you doubt? Was Peter afraid? Save me! Jesus didn't say, why are you afraid? Why do you doubt? Why? Because there's a decision to be made. Wind or word? We're going to talk this morning. And he put him back on the boat. And all the disciples said, surely this must be the son of God. You think so. 
This morning, let's look at what happens in this story. Jesus had just come off of performing one of the greatest miracles the disciples had seen to date. He had just went through the feeding of the 5,000. Immediately after feeding the 5,000, Jesus did everything he can to meet the great need of all those great many people. And Jesus realized, some of these people are on my nerves. Even Jesus had people get on his nerves. So Jesus decides, i got to get away from these people. i got to go spend time in prayer. So he tells his disciples, look, I'm about to bounce because all y'all are on my nerves. I need to go pray to make sure I've got my mind and everything right for what's next. I will meet you on the other side. The word was, I will meet you on the other side. It wasn't, let me tell you what's going to happen while you're on the way. But isn't it just like God and just like life? That sometimes after your greatest victories, your greatest miracles, and your happiest moments. Man, y'all believe that? We, we fed over 5,000 people. It was a miracle, y'all. That was crazy. It was crazy. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, praise God. Jesus is awesome. And Jesus is like, get. I'll meet you over there. Isn't it like God to send you somewhere and not tell you how you're necessarily going to get there and what you're going to experience on the way? Do you think for a second that Jesus did not know that on the way from where he was sending them to where they were going, they were going to hit a storm? We all experience storms in our life. A storm is there to get you off course. A storm is there to get you off focus. Because the question is, is it the wind or the word? What will you focus on? What will you think about in the middle of your storm? Will you think about what God told you, or will you focus on what you're seeing? And we're going to talk a little bit today, and I'm going to explain that better to you before we go. But the disciples, here they are, stuck out on the boat. The Bible says they're rowing and rowing and rowing. Things are getting hard. It's getting crazy. They, all, they think they're going to die. People in the boat screaming, we're going to die. they hiding. People laying, some people laying down, probably sucking their thumbs. Oh, Lord, oh, somebody help me. Oh, God, oh. You know, they're going all kind of stuff. They're freaking out, rolling around, whatever. It's dark. It's dark. The Bible says it was at the fourth watch of the night that Jesus came. We're going to talk later, and that's going to make, some, make that make sense to you. But all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And when Jesus shows up, they don't even think it's Jesus. Because a lot of times when the Lord shows up, up he don't come in a way that you think he ought to come and sometimes when he shows up if you don't have your if your focus and your faith right you can see the wrong thing when he does come they start calling the man a ghost the next thing you know Jesus starts talking Peter gets run his mouth he says Peter come and Peter gets out and what's he walk on wrong Peter didn't walk on water no man can walk on water if I took you right now at the end of a lake and threw you out the side of the boat, you would not just start walking unless you had a word. So while Peter's miracle manifested on top of the water, he was really walking on a word. That word was come. The moment the Lord gives you a word on something and it hits your spirit, God says, do it. It makes the impossible possible. God can take the most messed up situation. The waves are roaring. The wind is howling. Everything's falling apart. Everyone's scared. Sucking their thumb. God said, I got you. Come. And you step out. Listen, that's why God loves people that are water walkers. They'll jump past people that sit in the boat crying, whining, sucking their thumb. Talking about, excuse me while I get to Jesus. <laughs> you can stay there if you want to. But somebody told me there was safety where Jesus is. There was protection where Jesus is. There's health where Jesus is. I got to get where Jesus is. Is you can stay in the boat if you want to. The boat's going down. But I'm going to get out on a sea of impossibility and walk by faith, not by sight. Okay. I'm walking by faith, not by sight, because the wind, the wind is showing me something. First off, how can the wind show you something? Right, we're going to talk today before we go. Let me get, oh, my Lord, y'all spun the clock real fast on me. So give me about 50. Give me 15, 25 minutes. Come on. I love it when people say, take your time. Like, that's a really bad thing to say to me, but I love it when y'all do. Amen. Come on. Let the Lord use you. Watch this. Let me give you a few things to notice about this story because we, over the next few weeks, we're going to really hit how to, how to fight fear because fear is something we all experience. Fear will grip you. 
people, the enemy will use other people that think they're even helping you to try to build your fear. Can I tell you how many people have contacted me about, I can't believe you're out. I can't believe you're preaching. I can't believe you're doing this. Why? Because I've had a situation in my lungs. And they care. They genuinely care for me. They, they, they care. They care. But the enemy would try to use someone else's caring to get in my head to have me scared to death. If God wants me to die because of a virus and go to be with heaven sooner, guess what? I ain't changing it anyway. One glad morning when this life is over, I'm going to fly away. I'm going to take a trip on the good old gospel ship if I'm going. I'm just, I'm not, I can't live my whole life based on fear because what happens is fear will start to fight your faith. Now, I'm not talking about being dumb, right? You know, I shouldn't admit this to y'all, but as somebody that's, that deals with some seasonal allergies and has had a lung issue in the past, like I still can sneeze and I can, I can, I can cough almost at will. Like, it's one of the best things ever because now I will clear. You know that Walmart y'all are scared to go in? A thousand people up in there. I'll be walking up in the toilet paper hour like. Bruh, <coughs> 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 uh, ask my wife. Ask my wife. When we flew back from Texas the other week, I, you know, I, I cough a little bit. When I flew back, right, people were looking in the airport. So. I'm like, hey. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. That part, just like Moses part in the Red Sea, right? It definitely works. Trust me. Listen, here's some things I want you to notice about this text that I, I really want to get in relation to fear. Sometimes, write this down. Sometimes fear grips us when it does not seem that Jesus is there. Because there will be seasons and battles and issues and fights and storms and things in your life that are ordained that you're sent into but it doesn't seem like Jesus is there. But here's the thing you have to remember. Even when I can't feel him, even when I can't see him, he can still see me. Because Jesus went up to the mountain and he looked out at his disciples in the middle of their mess and he was watching them. Sometimes God leads you into a tough situation to see if you learn from it. Because here's what you need to know. A few months before this happened, the disciples were with Jesus and they watched him step out on the sea and rebuke it. Jesus had already shown them how to handle a storm. Many times after the Lord walks with you through a storm, he puts you in a storm to see if you finally learn what he showed you when he was with you in it. I'm about to give myself an offering and I, I, we give digitally so I don't have no cash. Sometimes it seems like he's not there when he's watching you in it. Sometimes he wants to see how hard you'll keep working to believe the word he gave you. No one said it was going to be easy to get to the other side. I just said I'll meet you there. There's always, man, I've said this before. Anytime God gives you a word and you're moving from one place to another place, you can expect hell in the hallway. Between one open door and another open door, you're going to face something in the middle of the hallway. There's going to be some kind of giant, some kind of storm, some kind of battle, something God's trying to do in you, get out of you, work with you. Listen, this is, that's how God functions. He's not just going to give you everything that's yours right when you think you deserve it and right in the middle of you're going through something. Jesus let them deal with the storm without his immediate presence because he was showing them the power of decision and obedience. Why? Because the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God, correct? The Bible says we're called to walk by what? Faith, right? Not by what? Oh my gosh, okay, let me help you. The fact is, what you have to know, some of you heard this because you come to Destination Church, you've been taught this before, some of you are newer, you may have never heard this before, but one of the ways we stop walking by faith and we start walking by sight is when we start being led by fear. Because notice what happens with Peter. The Bible says, and when Peter saw the wind, saw the wind, Peter started looking at the situation instead of listening to the word that was come. When he listened, listen, until what God has put in your heart and put in your ear becomes louder than what you're seeing around you, you'll struggle with walking by faith because sometimes life 
shows you something different than what God's trying to get to you. And so I cannot quit because life is showing me something that don't line up with what God's told me. I keep moving. If I get sick and God never heals me another day in my life, you'll never convince me he's not a healer. Because I walk by revelation, not situation. I know that God will heal. I know God heals. I've seen him do it. You can't change it from me. Even if I get sick, I could fall off, all my limbs fall off and die tomorrow. Some, some kind of rank sickness none of y'all ever heard of. It's a brand new one. Guess what? God's still a healer. And it necessarily didn't mean I didn't have faith because it's happened. Sometimes we go through something called life. I ain't got time to go there. What I'm telling you is that not everything happens to you is because of the devil either. The fact is sometimes God allows you to walk through things to help grow you, to grow your faith. God uses things you don't like. And the fact is God, his question for us is will you, will you decide to be obedient to what I've told you or will you wait until you, things look the way you think they should look before you act? Faith or sight, wind or word, what I'm seeing versus what I'm hearing it will be a battle we all have to deal with. And if we don't get this right, we will struggle with fear. Because fear will show you things that's different than what God has said. Fear will have you all. As a matter of fact, Job said it this way. Job said in Job chapter 3, the thing which I most dread or the thing that I most have feared I, basically has come upon me. Job said, I feared so much and I let this be in me so much, I basically brought it upon myself. I talked myself sick. There are some people, I shouldn't admit this, and I'm not going to say how I know this, but in my years of being connected to all kinds of people and medical professionals, I've known people personally that have went to the hospital, and this is back in the day, so I'm sure there's laws against this now, that they would get shot up with water thinking they were getting value and would leave feeling better. You think I'm playing. I'm not, I'm not playing. I... I, I that's God's honest truth. And nurses and people that work in the hospital that's in here right now that would tell you I'm telling the truth because they were there. Some of y'all told me this. <clears throat> anyway. I ain't trying to get y'all fired. But people's mind was so convinced something was wrong with them that they received something that wasn't even the medicine they thought they were getting and were fine. Because the power of your mind, the power of fear gripping you, fear is a crazy thing. We should never take it lightly. It'll grab you. Listen, when I sat in front of the doctor that day and they were looking at all my charts and were basically telling me in no uncertain terms that I had cancer, you think for a second you hear that, that that don't hit you? I don't care who you are, saved, speaking tongues, all that. I don't care. That stuff will go in your mind and it will keep you up at night. And watch this, like, like the Ghetto Boys sung a long time ago, your mind starts playing tricks on you. You start thinking things that's happening that's not even happening. It's the way it works. Sometimes well, fear will grip you in such a way to make you think that God isn't there. What has God told you to do? But he hasn't given you all of the details. Are you obedient? Or has fear stopped you? Are you at least in the boat rowing? Or are you scared to death? Number two, write this down. Fear comes when I question, will he show up? Will he show up? Why are you send me on this boat, Jesus? Where are you at now? We all about to die. See, you guys, talk, we, all, we talk all tough today, but if, put yourself in a disciple's position. You were there when the ship was going down and Jesus stood up and handled it. Now you're there and no one's around. Just you and a bunch of other scared folks. The fact is many times we have to keep rowing through the night even without Jesus there cheering us on. Sometimes in order to defeat fear I have to learn how to labor in the dark. The dark meaning the absence of revelation and the absence of God's presence because he's light. He brings light. I told you earlier, I'll explain to you what the Bible means by the fourth watch of the night. So to understand the Roman calendar and Roman time, the fourth watch of the night, how they kept the time at night was this. Typically from about 6 to 9 p.m. was about the first watch. Give or take our 9 p.m. to about midnight, second watch, 12 to 3, 
third watch, about four, three, three to about six is the final watch. It was the last moment of night. That means the Lord let them deal with it all night long. Can you still keep pushing? Can you still keep rowing? Jesus, it would have been nice for you to show up at about 9.52. Like for real. Like you know what we're going through. You up on the mountain praying. You see us out here. Why are you chilling? He waits to the fourth watch of the night. Then here comes Jesus. Why? Because when you start to live in faith and not fear, you understand that God's timing isn't always your timing. And I can't allow the fact that I'm not seeing God the way I want to see him right now to dispute the fact that God's on the way and he's going to show up right in the middle of my mess when he needs to be here. What's the third thing that comes into this next part? This one is this. They say it. It's a ghost. We see a ghost. Well, what does that mean when it comes to fear, Pastor Sean? Here's the thing. Fear will leave us quickly seeing things in an improper or a former way. What happens many times when we get afraid we fall back to what we know. For the fishermen, what they knew was superstition. They had been out on the sea at night before. They had heard all the stories about ghosts walking around in the water. They, they had seen the mermaids, right, in their minds. They had a certain frame of reference that when you were in a storm, especially when something was arising against you on the water, that, that ghost coming could be a harbinger of death. They immediately start to think an old way when they were in a new problem. That's how a lot of us function. The moment we get afraid and the moment we have a new problem, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll approach it with an old mindset. I'm going to fight this the way I used to. I'm going to see this the way I used to. Jesus is calling you to think different, to see it different, to know he's with you. Old, what old ways of seeing things and doing things do we fall back into when we're gripped with fear? There are people that's in an old relationship that was supposed to stay old, but it's become new again because they were afraid to be alone for a minute. Oh, Jesus. Instead of just dealing with you and getting healed, you're so afraid of not having somebody, you'd rather settle and be with something you know is not for you, especially not for the long haul, you'd rather keep that around so that, you, you know, you're so afraid to do. Because the truth is, the whole reason a lot of the relationships probably isn't working to begin with is because you still haven't dealt with you being alone. Until, until we're ever alone, God can't make us who we're supposed to be. That's why even if you're married, you should still be single. Let me help you. I don't mean single like you out there dropping like it's hot, acting crazy. <laughs> Not, like, what kind of church did I come to? Praise the Lord. Someone should have told me about destination sooner. <laughs> what I mean by that is by being single, there's a place of singleness that happens between me and God where I understand that I'm com comfortable with who God's made me and I'm 100% whole between me and him. He has singly filled all my empty places where I don't need you or another human to be for me what he's designed to be because it's not fair. I don't care. Listen, I, I know you watch Jerry Maguire. You complete me. That's not how it works. Another person's never designed to complete you. They're designed to compliment you. I am dropping bombs for y'all, and y'all ain't saying amen. Y'all sleep, scared. If you clap or say amen, it won't make you sick. What I'm saying is that we're designed by God to be complete in him. That way what I bring to my relationships, I am a blessing. I'm an addition, not a leech. It's hard to hug vampires. It's hard to love people that suck you dry. It's hard. It's not easy. You're asking yourself some trouble. Y'all got some twilight spirit on you. Running around thinking you got done found Edward. A sissy vampire glowing in the sun. What's wrong with that? Well, shiny vampires are dumb stuff. Anyway, I better get back to the word. <laughs> At least do your vampires right. Watch this. What old ways do we fall back into when we get afraid to trust God for something new? And the last thing is this. The word is different than the wind and that the word requires faith and obedience. Peter was told to come. And as long as his eyes were on Jesus, there was no problems. Everything was okay. But when he started to look at the circumstances, 
The reason fear has gripped so many people, one thing that this whole virus pandemic has taught me is that the Christian church in America is weak. Christians, we are weak because we are so apt to be scared and believe everything we see and everything we, we are so afraid. We got Christians fighting and scratching each other over some toilet paper. It's a lung disease. You ain't getting diarrhea from it. People fighting over toilet paper. You fight, we fighting. Saved, but we'll fight you. Listen, I tell, oh, never mind. Uh, listen, I'm not saying to not use wisdom. I'm not saying not to be smart. I'm not saying, what I'm saying is we are so governed by fear. And here's the bad thing. We don't understand that by nature, we're designed by God to trust in kingdom government. But the governments created by men are not anything but that. And we have the audacity to think that we could turn over all of our control of everything to governments and think, and think we're going to be safer? What is wrong with people? You know what's funny? Lord, forgive me. It's not funny. It's just that this, this was a, that was a pastor faux pas. I always try to get people's attention by saying, you know what's funny. This is not funny. A friend of mine just sent me a picture, but he was kind of making light of the situation in America. He sent a picture of a toilet paper aisle being empty. And then he sent a picture of his wife's homeland where for two years every store has been completely empty of everything because of the type of government that they have and that people in this country want. It's ridiculous. Just People have no idea. They just think something sounds good and they jump on it. They don't use any kind of common sense or wisdom. It's ridiculous. Here's all I'm telling you. This situation is not bigger than God. We have to understand the Christian's response is to be word over wind. Fear is natural. We have to resist it. We have to fight it. If you did not have to resist and fight fear, the Lord would not fill the whole Bible with fear nots. Don't fear. Fear not. Don't fear. Don't fear. I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. Fear not. Don't fear. If we didn't struggle with fear, he wouldn't say it so much. We have to understand when it comes to him, he'll send us into a test, and there will be word, and there will be wind. The choice is what you magnify. Let's magnify the word in our life. Let's be people that show the world, listen, yes, we're going to be smart. We're not going to act like this isn't a real issue and there's nothing really going on and everything's okay. There's always extremes with people. And like some of my word of faith buddies, they're out there right now just going crazy like, oh, y'all don't got no faith and da, 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 da. And, I, and come on, man, that's not, that's not right. And then you have other people bashing the church like, why would y'all stay open? Well, well, because we're called to be a hospital. We're called to be a place where people get healed. We're called to be a place, as long as you're not breaking any laws, we're called to be a light in darkness. And guess what? If you're not a cessationist, you still believe God's given you the power over things. And it's my job to, to, to show people a better way. There are people, there's, there's people that come to our service in Frederick. There's, I mean, we have first-time guests today. There are, there are people coming, they need answers. They're afraid. They're scared. Life is crazy. They want, to, they want to run to the house of God and have a word of God in here that can help change their life and touch them. They need to hear that God is for them, not against them. They need to know that God is bigger than a sickness. They need to know that God is able to protect you and keep you and lead you and guide you. No matter, and they need to know there's hope. They need to understand that this life we live is a temporary life anyway. You are made with spirit. You are spirit. You live in a body. You possess a soul, but you're a spirit. That's why no matter what medical science tries to do, eventually when your spirit decides to leave, there's nothing they can do to keep it. When God wants you home and calls you home, you go stand before him. And he loves you so much that he wrapped himself in flesh and allowed himself to take. Do you realize that Jesus, this isn't the first time he's heard of coronavirus? He received it. Y'all <laughs> He took it. He took it, every sickness, every disease, every, every, all of it. He said, get poured all on me. 
I don't want it. I don't want this. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And the full weight of mankind's sin, sickness, and disease hit our Canaan king so strong that he sat while praying for you and for me. Blood began to drip from his brow. His capillaries began to break under the full weight of what he dealt with. And he did it for you and for me. Stepped from eternity into time and came at the perfect time. So that now, because of one man's obedience, all can be saved. And he loves you. I don't care what you've done. And guess what? I don't care where you're at, what you're doing. You could be doing some crime in your life right now that God's not cool with. Because don't get me wrong, God's a holy God. He is. He loves you no matter what. You have kids, don't you? Your kids ever done anything real grimy? You still love them. You might be irritated. You might want to break your foot off. But it doesn't mean you don't love them. you still my child. I love you. But you, listen, sometimes a, a parent knows when to let a seed germinate, manifest, come full force, and let you deal with it. Some seasons a parent covers you. Other seasons people say, okay, you need to learn your lesson from this. Doesn't mean they don't love you. It's, it's sometimes you reap what you sow. The God that we serve loves you. There is no, he doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, when you come to him just as you are, the Bible says if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, you shall be saved, period, point, blank. It doesn't say unless you're blank, unless you do drugs, unless you get high, unless you're a whoremonger, unless you're this, unless, it doesn't say any of that. He says, you come, I love you, I'll save you, let me deal with the rest. The problem with, well, yeah, yeah. I think one of the biggest problems with the gospel that's being preached in America is we've presented a Jesus that doesn't ask for any kind of heart change. Because with heart change comes lifestyle change. You can't change your heart and your not, life not be shifted. So what we've done is we've presented the, the world with a Jesus that doesn't require anything from us. So the closer I draw to God, the more things about me he don't like he starts to work on. Y'all are quiet. We don't like that part of Jesus. That's why we like the Savior Jesus, not the Lord Jesus. Because Lord means owner. It means I love you, but I want to I wanna be in your life, get in your business. It might not be now. It might be five years from now. But eventually that rape you went through that you won't deal with, and now you hate the world and you're nasty and bitter. It might be a few years, but eventually we're going to open that room. I'm going to talk to you. That thing that you do, you know you shouldn't be doing. I'm, listen, I love you. You're my child. We're going to work on that. But eventually, oh, yeah, we're going to talk. That's how he works because he loves us. Don't take it personal. Be excited about it. Every time God shows me something bad about me, I, listen, I fall down before him. I just, I just thank him. Thank you. I need to know. I guess I'm the different type of person than some people. Some people like to put their head in the sand and let stuff go. If I got something wrong with me, I need to know about it. Tell me. Don't be the friend that goes to eat dinner with me. I got pepper in my teeth and you ain't saying nothing. I'm there talking away because that's what I do. I can't wait. I'm an extrovert. That's how I roll. Got all kinds of stuff in my teeth talking to you and you're like, No, and Diagon Wells going up on Facebook. <laughs> Love you guys, man. Praying for you. Let's all stand. I want to believe God for you guys this morning. I'm excited for this series. Please stay on the lookout of what's going on. Like I said, we'll do everything we can to provide a safe atmosphere for all of our people to worship. And if local governments and, and, and wisdom says that we need to alter how we have service for a minute while things um, smooth over, what are they saying, Crystal? What was, what'd you say, Pastor Crystal? What'd you say to me this morning? Something about the curve? Oh, come on, man. She said something this morning that sounded pretty trendy. I guess that's what they're saying. I've tried to turn off some of the news and stuff because it'll drive me crazy. So I'm like, look, I'm going to be out here riding. If too many people around, I'm just going to do a fake cough. I'm going to be good. <laughs> uh, I'll be clearing you out clearing you out but um we're just we're just believing god i want to pray for all of you i want to i want to decree and declare blessing and health to be upon you just keep like i said mydestination.cc friend me on facebook your church on facebook so you know everything's going on if something comes up because i know a lot of local churches have already decided to go digital and all that if we have to do something like that for a minute we will it'll be the same singing presence worship giving, sowing, amen, sowing famine, man, this is a good time to give, don't stop being a giver because you're scared, now's the time to sow, amen, matter of fact, not just the church, but 
if something like this keeps getting bad, it's going to hurt local places. And if you are nervous and you're not supposed to be and you don't want to be out eating and stuff around people, that's fine. But if you normally say, say you go, say you go to, you like Alfredo's, what you can do is go, 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 if you have to and you're nervous, buy a gift card or something to keep supporting and just wait. And once you feel comfortable again, go. Because, oh, they deliver too. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. DoorDash. Let's go. <laughs> we just have to remember. This is not a time for us to back up, be scared. we got to continue to sow, continue to move, continue to give, continue to push. I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of hearing, like, even preachers. I've been in a bunch of meetings, and guys are like, oh, we're nervous about this, and people won't give, and whatever. And I was like, not our church. I must believe it. And then people are going to sow. We're gonna, we ain't stopping how we live. We just know that, okay, that's just me. I'm going to be up in here preaching, even if it's just me. Me and Pastor Crystal have had a lot of one-on-one preaching sessions in here. We have to do a few more. She'll be back there running the camera, looking right at me. She even amens me. When she's doing the camera, she, like, talks to me and everything. When when she's down front, she just stares at me. When she's running the camera, she's like, she's like, yes, yes. She goes, yes. Because she's, I don't know if she's trying to hurry me up or she's, I just take it as encouragement. Amen. If you're in here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible now says to those who call upon the name of the Lord be saved, but I also told you the main declaration of the salvation Jesus is Lord earlier. I told you Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that those that believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that he, he enters into our life into a special relationship. So if that's you this morning, if you just pray this after me, dear Jesus, I'm here today and I recognize my need for you. I, I believe that you gave your life on the cross for me. I ask God that you come into my life and save me and change me. Help me to, help me to live for you the best that I, I can. God, I want to be who you've called me to be. I want to enter into this relationship with you. I don't want to live by fear or anxiety or depression. I want to trust in you in all things. Father, this morning, I just pray over all those that are here. If there's anybody here that's sick in body today, we send our word. God, that word that comes from you, we send you into the arena. We send the Holy Spirit right now carrying the blood of Jesus, the living word, into the, the situation. And we know if you fixed, uh, you created us, you can fix us. So if there's anybody here sick this morning, Lord, I pray right now that you would heal them completely. God, we as a church... We stand in prayer today. We bind every spirit of sickness, any infirmity, anything that's moving around in the heavenlies that's not from you. We come against it in agreement. We speak against this virus right now. We command it right now to loose its hold off of people, that people would start to see miraculous turnarounds right now. God, let the world see the church is praying. God, let us pray again. Let us seek your face, God. We just decree and declare health and wealth and blessing and healing and wholeness, everything that's in the kingdom. It lands in our households. So, God, for everyone connected to Destination Church, everyone that's here this morning right now, I speak favor and blessing to be upon them. God, I pray the healing will be upon them. The healing is the children's bread, and they are your children. So, God, protect them and keep them, God, that no weapon formed against them can prosper. And, God, we just stand on that promise. We pray you make us a people of the word and not the wind. God, let us see and hear what you're saying more than what the world is saying. God, let us not succumb to fear. But let us walk in faith. Let us show people the love of God and the mercy of God. And I pray that in this season, you make the church an example. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Love.